Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India cinema has been a traveling cinema. It has been traveling for a long time. And when we talk about the global flows of Bollywood, uh, we seem to ignore these earlier flows of Hindi cinema, which have been going on almost for a hundred years. In this module, in this unit, I am going to sh take you to the old and the new spaces, exhibition spaces of uh, Hindi, Hindi cinema and, to, and also Bollywood cinema to show you that global flows of cinema, of Indian cinema predate the flows of Bollywood cinema beginning in the 90s. When did these flows begin? How the, how did the Hindi films, how did not just Hindi films, how did Indian films travel before the era of globalization? Where did they travel? Who was watching these films? And what is the impact that they had on people who watched these films? How, what, impact, what effects did they have on different groups of people who watched these films? So, the question uh, we are going to explore in this unit is who's watching Bollywood's films and we'll get the answer by looking at who was watching Indian films in the past. The title is Bollywood at Large. Uh, I'm going to look at the narrative of globalization, cosmopolitanism and mundialization. So on one hand we have uh, Christianity, the civilizing mission, the de uh, development of the global market and each of these corresponds to different global designs and certainly originates different local histories corresponding to the same global designs. We define globalization as a, a set of designs to manage the world and we oppose it with cosmopolitanism which is a set of projects towards planetary conviviality. And mundialization is defined as local histories in which global, global designs are enacted or where they have to be adapted, adopted, transformed and re-articulated. So I am going to summarize this once again. I am going to make a contrast between globalization which is a set of designs to manage the world and define, borrow the definition which, uh, which in which cosmopolitanism is understood as a set of projects towards planetary conviviality. So, one is a positive aspect of globalization and the other is a negative aspect of globalization and mondialization is a process in which local histories in which global designs are enacted or where they have to be adapted, adopted, transformed and re-articulated. And I would look at these, uh, the, the, the movements, the travels of Indian cinema in the past as well as those in the present corresponding to different global designs and certainly originates different local histories responding to the same global designs. So, as these uh, we, we read it in the context of the fears about, about Hollywood cinema uh, swamping the world and driving out all local cinemas, all local Indian industries and Indian cinema is a living example, is a shining example if we may say to how it has um, uh, it, it has not only uh, withstood the onslaught of Hollywood cinema in the era of globalization, but it has always offered stiff competition to Hollywood cinema even in the past with audience not only in South Asia, 
but also in some other parts of the world, preferring Indian cinema to productions from Hollywood or from the West. Now, the objective of this unit is to trace the different stages of Hindi cinema's movement in order to compare Bollywood's contemporary global flows with Hindi films broader crossings in the imperial and national era. How are they different? Uh, and I am going to make a distinction between distribution and circulation. So, in the first stage, what I see is a distribution, not, not necessarily in the first stage, because it cuts across both the stages. On one hand, we have distribution of Indian films, the formal distribution of Indian films during colonialism, during nation building and globalization. And this distribution is essentially uh, controlled by status policies on distribution, export or exhibition. On the other hand, we have circulation of the same films through porous legalities. And this circulation, which I would call leakage, is, uh, is, an, is an example of globalization from below. It is an example of mentalization, which marries politics with pragmatics. And I use the, I've used the term, the metaphor leakage a term which is often used in India to talk about, to, sh to show how, uh, I, I prefer this term to the term jugar, which is being, uh, which is in common currency now, to show how uh, uh, leakage, leaking is the way Indians have always gotten around bent rules, have gotten around bureaucratic procedures, uh, have crossed boundaries and this is an appropriate metaphor for describing how Hindi films have always, Indian films have always leaked across the borders of India. We begin with the colonial era and the understanding of uh, imperial territories as a global market. I am uh, indebted to Priya Jay Kumar's book where she talks about how the entire empire was uh, was considered a single territory as far as the marketing of or distribution of films were concerned, not just the marketing and production and consumption, but also in terms of policies, the entire market was seen as, uh, all imperial territories were seen as a single global market. And that meant the uniformity of imperial policies across the colonies. And the imperial anxieties, so ironically, imperial anxieties about Hollywood cinema on the effects of uh, on, on, on British authority, we are talking about a British uh, power, a B British empire in crisis, e extremely anxious about its dwindling authority or sovereignty over native populations, and the role of cinema, the the role of cinema, the perceived role of cinema in reinforcing certain stereotypes and constructing a negative image of, uh, of white races among the native people, of white people as depraved or morally corrupt. And for this reason, the British um, uh, imperial government adopts a policy, introduces an act which uh, Wor uh, it's worries, anxieties about Hollywood cinema's effects on the superiority of the white race would entail for the British Empire, encourage the exhibition and distribution of Indian films in India and in the Indian diaspora. And how did this happen? This happened with the introduction of the Cinematographic or Quota Act of 1927, which stipulated that a certain uh, o that uh, the only a very small percentage of the films exhibited in the empire would be uh, Hollywood films. The majority of the films should be uh, films produced in the empire. Now, the renters who exhibited films, they exploited the loopholes in the act for very pragmatic rather than um, uh, benevolent reasons. They uh, wanted to maximize their profits, and they found that Indian films produced in India 
technically uh, qualified as empire films, but were considerably che cheaper than films made in Britain. And they, the renters were the people who were not necessarily Indians, who were the one first to have exhibited Indian films in the diaspora to meet the requirements of the Quota Act. And this is how Indian films came to be exhibited in the various Indian diasporas, often with the complicity of British officials in India who believed that these these films uh, were were would be appropriate entertainment for Indian coolies and Indian workers in the plantations and the various diasporas rather than the ho than rather than Hollywood films, which would have a negative in if a negative impact on the power of or sovereignty of white people over native people in, um, in the perception of the native viewers. So, th due to this act, Indian films have been traveling to the Indian diasporas ever since the 30s. Uh, we are talking about the era of silent cinema, the silent era and Indian uh, cinema began almost around it's almost coeval with cinema in other parts of the world, with uh, the um, uh, in the uh, first film having been made in the second decade of the 20th century, and in the by the 30s, Indian films were already being exhibited in the Indian diasporas to Indian plantation workers, uh, namely in uh, the, so it was Samikanu Vincent's Ten Cinemas. Uh, one uh, an, an entrepr very enterprising uh, exhibitor who took his films not only uh, who took his traveling tent cinema not only to different parts of India. I must uh, first of all uh, 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 bring to your notice that films were not exhibited in uh, if cinema halls before uh, in the 30s, they were still being ex exhibited in open air, theat open air theaters or in 10 cinemas, not only in India, but in, uh, in the diasporas. Uh, and it was Sami Kano Vin Vincent's 10 cinemas, which traveled to Burma, Manaya and to uh, other places. And as well some of the earliest, now the films that were exhibited since this was a silent era, uh, the uh, in the uh, in the silent era, the films could have been in any Indian uh, were Indian films rather than Hindi films. And even after the coming of uh, even in the with the coming of sound, uh, not only Hindi films but films in other languages. For instance, Tamil films, because the majority of migrant workers in the British Malaya were Tamil speaking. Tamil films like um, uh, were also being shown. One of the earlier f earliest Tamil films was Wali Tirumanam, but it's not one is not quite sure whether this film was exhibited by Sami Kanu Vincent, but films like this were being shown in the plantations in British Malaya. Uh, it was the same with Fiji and uh, we have uh, anecdotal evidence from uh, Fijians like Vijay Mishra who talk about having watched uh, some mythological uh, several mythological films in their childhood and um, there is uh, uh, d uh, more uh, evidence of the film Bala Joban being screened in Trinidad in in the West in, in Trinidad uh, in 1934 and films traveled to Trinidad in 1930, not only Fiji, but also to the West Indies, including to Trinidad and Guyana and Bala Joban, uh, which was made in 1934, was one such film. Now, during the World War and the independence movements, there was another market for opening up for Indian films. And this was a market for films not only in places where Indian troops were stationed, but also in other regions for uh, in uh, regions in which Indian diasporas were located or places which had an earlier history of the exhibition of in Indian films like British Malaya, but not, not only 
uh, to meet the diaspora's need to connect with the homeland, obviously the plantation workers who had no hope of returning home and in that era of low connectivity had almost nil connection with the homeland. The sole uh, connection they had with the homeland was were the myths that were create myths of the homeland that they created uh, in relation to the Hindi films they saw. And as Mishra puts it, these become this these became new myths along with the old myths like the epics, the Hindu epics, and the other Puranic myths for these plantation workers or the Indian diasporas, the older diasporas. But uh, in the, uh, with the Second World War, they were deemed as a uh, right entertainment for Indian troops. But it was a more interesting, uh, a very different reason which, uh, created a, which created a taste for Indian films in the British Malaya, particularly in Singapore. And that was due to the Japanese occupation of the state settlements. Uh, when uh, the Japanese uh, took over the two major cinema uh, house, uh, uh, cinema uh, conglomerates rather than cinema houses in the state settlements, namely Shaw Brothers and Cathy who were forced to become managers of the Japanese, or owners were forced to become uh, managers of the Japanese. And the audience were offered a choice between watching Japanese propaganda films and Indian films. Uh, for reasons very different from the British, the Japanese also discouraged the screening of Hollywood films. Uh, because they were made by Americans, uh, because they were made in America, and indirectly, unwittingly encouraged the viewing of Hindi films or Indian films in Singapore. So obviously, the uh, obviously the audience <laughs> preferred uh, Indian films, which were seen by the uh, Japanese as harmless and pure inter entertainment in the same ma manner as the British. Saw, saw them as harmless and, and pure entertainment for the, uh, for the purpose of uh, keeping the, uh, the plantation workers happy. But as a result of this, a new audience for Indian films emerged in the streets settlement. Not only the Malay people of uh, the streets settlements, who have always been big fans of Indian films from the beginning, a certain generation of Chinese audience also were, uh, were uh, grew up on these films. They watched in theaters during the war, uh, during the Japanese occupation, and became big fans of Indian films. Now, uh, when we move from uh, Singapore to Indonesia, we find Indian films traveled to Indonesia in 1945 with the Indian troops. And they were very important in the, uh, since there was no local Indonesian film industry, they were very important in the founding of the film industry, both in Singapore and in Indi Indonesia, as well as in 1940s, they traveled to Sri Lanka, where again, th it was during the Second World War, and they were meant for the entertainment of troops. Now, I have an image of uh, 10 cinemas. This is not really an image of 10 cine cinemas in Singapore, but an image from Amit Madhesia's 10 cinemas. Uh, and we find that when we look at the cinematic assemblage in Singapore, it's anchored to several other assemblages. The contemporary assemblage is is anchored to other assemblages of older Tamil and Sikh Singaporeans and new professional migrants, Nepali, Beng Bengali guest workers, Malays, and a few Chinese. Now, in 1956, between 1956 to 1962, we have evidence, we have records of the formal distribution and export of Indian over films overseas. Uh, this is, I have taken the UNESCO report 
as uh, to support uh, uh, to get information about where and uh, how many films were exported during these years. And according to this report, it's uh, only 10% of the total films produced between 56 and 62 were exported to the West, and the remaining 90% were into the traditional, were exported to the traditional markets of Indian films in both in the West and the non-West, but mainly in East Africa, Thailand, Malaya, Ceylon, I'm using the old names because this, these are the names used in the report, Burma, Vietnam and Persian Gulf, which have traditionally formed the markets for Indian films since, since the 50s or even earlier. Now, 100 films were exported during these years to the West and out of these, 0.5 percent share was taken by Russia. So majority, Russia emerged as a major market for Indian films during this period. This was the era, era of the, 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 the alliances that India was, being for, uh, was trying to form with Russia. And the export of Indian films was uh, tacitly and actively encouraged by the Indian state. And we have images of the film actors Raj Kapoor and Nargis accompanying Pandit Nehru on his visits to US. And as a result of that, uh, that export of Indian films uh, in Russia in the 50s and the 60s, Russia still remains a major market for Indian films even today. And there's an entire dubbing industry in Russia uh, based on Indian films. Um, China was another market. And some of the films, uh, the old Chinese still remember songs from Raj Kapoor films. Once again, the, these were the Raj Kapoor films, namely the films Avara, and you'd find Chinese singing Avala Hu in China. Uh, there are reports that 111 films were exported to Greece. They were exported to countries of Eastern Europe, such as Bulgaria. and. Uh, During the 70s, we find, a, and I uh, wanted to show, I've used this picture of uh, a screening of a film in uh, multiplex in Bangkok, in the Central Mall in Bangkok. And the, the two Sikhs that you see in the picture, whose faces are not visible, they are uh, the sons of the, the, the person who who was the sole distributor of Indian films in all of Southeast Asia until the 70s. Now, with the ending of the formal export of Indian films in Southeast Asia, the brothers have uh, been forced to turn over to other more lucrative businesses. But out of uh, respect for their father's memory, they still uh, hold viewings. They still organize viewings of Indian films at least on one Sunday or uh, one weekend in a month, largely of the hit Bollywood films as a homage to their father's memory. But the reports are that in the 70s, for, uh, for some reason, the, there was a decline in the export of Indian films overseas. Uh, and these reports have come from various regions, from the Caribbean, from Thailand, from Africa, uh, audience in Africa who I have interviewed re recall having watched many of the films of the 70s in theatres. Similarly, audience in Indonesia remember ha being taken to, uh, uh, to watch Indian films in theatres in uh, Jakarta, for instance, uh, or in Ghana, in Tanzania, uh, both diasporic Indians as well as um, non-Indians, Africans uh, remember, recall having watched, uh, regularly watched films in theater. Mera Nam Joker in Tanzania, for instance, which was screened in open air theaters in Tanzania. And uh, my respondent, uh, who is now based in Canada, recalls having watched Shole in 1976 in Ghana, 
where he was a school boy and he bounced school to watch the film Shole. So uh, what was interesting here is that uh, there is a complete change in the, uh, in the audience of Indian films from the Indian diasporas in the old diasporas such as Fiji, Trinidad, Tobago, the British Malaya, where the presence of the Indian diaspora also creates a taste for Indian films among other people in the, uh, in the places of settlement such as the Malay in the Straits Settlement followed by the Chinese uh, and in, in Africa we find um, uh, my respondent uh, shared with me that uh, she watched Mera Naam Joker, Joker 13 times in Tan Tanzania and uh, those of us who have watched Mera Naam Joker, yes it has become a cult film today but uh, when it was released in 1970, it was uh, one of the major flops of Raj Kapoor. So I was very curious to know why would anybody want to watch 13 the film 13 times. And the answer was the that people did not go to watch films in the diasporas. The reason why they went to watch films or watched a film 13 times in the diaspora was that they uh, there was uh, this was the films help them produce certain forms of so sociality, doing the Indian tra thing, dressing Indian, speaking Indian languages, Indian eating Indian food and just letting their hair down. So uh, this was up to the 70s and one of the reasons which I surmise could have been responsible for the, uh, for the decline or almost the ending of the formal exports or distribution of Indian films overseas was the 70s video boom. So an, a, an informal economy uh, mushroomed during this period uh, which was de decentralized, which was uncontrolled and uh, whose uh, ownership was also distributed. Now this economy this video boom uh, is an example of mondialization because it challenges the monopoly of state controlled media because of the absence of provisions related to exhibition in censorship act it was possible for people to circulate and view films in video parlors. So one is curious to know that when Hindi films were no longer being formally screened in cinema halls or they were not being exported uh, even to uh, there has always been an, a ban on Indian films in neighboring nations like Pakistan and Bangladesh where no films were uh, screened after 65. Uh, how is it that uh, generations of viewers in those nations ha are familiar with, with films produced during this era? And the answer is the video boom because copies of films were being illegally produced in Pakistan and distributed by a company based in Dubai and being circulated all across the world in parlors such as this. This is an image of uh, a parlor in uh, Bangkok opposite the Vadda Gurdwara in Bangkok and it's, it's a perfect example of the porous legalities that Ravi Sundaram and others uh, talk about because uh, uh, in technical terms th it stands on the cusp of legality and illegality because it is uh, really circulating pirated videos of Indian films, CDs and DVDs of Indian films. But the, the owner, uh, owner's wife you see in the video <laughs> doesn't look much like a pirate to me. And uh, the video, it is parlors like this or CD shops like this which uh, which kept alive the taste for Indian films, uh, not only in uh, not only in the diasporic audience, the NRI audience in different parts of the world, but also in non-diasporic, the local ethnic audience. For instance, in this video parlor, I came upon several Thais walking in to come and rent DVDs or buy DVDs of Hindi films, of the latest Hindi films. When I expressed my surprise, I was told that the Thais are big lovers, have been always a big lov lovers of 
Indian films and again there is a entire dubbing industry based on Indian films in, Thai, uh, in Thailand and these Thais were borrowing the dubbed versions of the films from this uh, video parlor. So the global flows which have been enabled by satellite television through cable networks through internet theatrical exhibition have created new markets for Indian films uh, overseas. They have always been these traditional markets but now we have new markets of Indian films which changes according to the direction, the class and age of the audience. So there is an intermixing. Uh, the new markets are in the old traditional markets of Bollywood films but they have also spread to new areas in the west, new generations of viewers and um, these uh, porous legalities and subculture of piracy, they, there's a sphere of illegality, the production, distribution, exhibition, the porous avenues, porous boundaries and avenues of partition they offer to viewers, they allow them to watch films uh, uh, and perform, allow them to perform forms of sociality which would not be available to them any otherwise. So in Dubai it's Bollywood nights on the weekends for the majority of work laborers across the UAE who can enjoy blockbusters on the wide screen for free. This is Sunita Menon reporting on 2007. We will move on in the next session we will move on we will compare the old markets the traditional markets of Bollywood films with new markets for Bollywood film through two case studies. Thank you.